Good morning. Good morning. Wow. Jack is a tough act to follow, I gotta tell ya. Wow. All right, and Joel's giving me the, you know, so here, I'll, I'll just go through this. All right, I'm gonna talk about everybody's favorite subject, strengthening your conviction in giving. Right on, yes. The title of my uh, remarks today is, Who Owns Your French Fries? Wow. Who Owns Your French Fries? That's right. It's the story of a man who buys his little boy some French fries. Then the father does what all fathers do. He grabs a fry. Joel, I know other people who do this, Joel. I don't know. It's, uh, I happen to be, you know, I'm trying to lose some weight. I had a, my date last night was with my grandson, Brenton, and I put on, you know, I'm having my quinoa. I put on my YouTube videos for him, and I can't tell you how many of his fries I stole. Yeah. It, was, it was not a... But anyway, so the father, you know, steals the fry. The, the, um, the little boy slaps his hand and says, don't touch my fries. The father thinks that his son is being very selfish. The father knows that he bought the fries and they belong to him. The father knows that his son belongs to him. The father could get angry and never buy his son fries again, or he could just flood him with fries. So uh, the father thinks, why is my son so selfish? I've given him a whole package of French fries. I just want one single fry. God is, in the same respect, God has given us money. When he asks for a tithe, people figuratively slap his hand and say, keep, keep your hands off my money. God, that's, thank you. God owns everything we have. God owns everything we have. He wants us to manage what we have for his glory. God expects us to manage our time, talent, temple, testimony, and treasures. And he expects us to give back a portion of what he's given us. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so when I come, no collections have to be made. The topic that Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians 16 is money. He says the word in the verse. He's not talking about collecting food. He's not doing a, a blood drive. He's not doing a clothing drive or anything else, but he's specifically talking about the giving and collecting of money. Paul does not shy away from money in any of his letters and addresses it when appropriate. Paul teaches us a lot about giving. For example, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each person should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, God loves a cheerful giver. Can I get an amen? amen. For example, 1 Timothy 6 through uh, 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. I'm sure we've all heard that phrase. Money is a root of all evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul has important truths for us on the topic of giving. He shares it in many letters. Paul teaches us about the spiritual exercise of giving. You also call it a habit, a discipline, a requirement, a command, or some other term, but it's definitely there. There are numerous passages in the Bible that talk about tithing. One of my favorite is this next one, Malachi 3, verses 8 through 12. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how am I robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, said the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord. So my advice is to test this. I have actually done this myself. We moved from um, Las Vegas to Seattle a couple years ago. We joined the church, and we actually started tithing. And I don't mean giving, I mean tithing. Our whole life we've gone to churches. We've, we've traveled around, um, lived in different places on the West Coast. I've even been um, the, on the uh, finance committee of a church. I still wasn't tithing. I was getting close to what I was giving. But the Lord says, um, 
<laughs> you should be tithing. So what I did on an act of faith, we joined the church here, we started tithing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, you know, that's 10% of my income, you know, but God does provide. And I don't mean, I don't mean you get the money dollar for dollar. I mean, you get more back. That has been, that has been our experience. You know, it's, a, it's all about faith. We have actually gotten more back. And so now I'm a cheerful giver. I mean, we were... I, because it's, it's an investment. It's an investment in your soul, and, you know, it tends to pay off. So anyway, no. But that's not why we do it. So my message tonight is to trust in God, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and you will be blessed. And remember who actually owns your French fries. Thank you. Well, my dad did eat my french fries growing up, but um, <laughs> this was an incredible time. I hope you enjoyed all the speakers that gave their hearts to us. Let's give them a round of applause. You know, the title of this, this section was Be Strong in the Grace, coming out of 2 Timothy 2.1. So I took away five different things. First, get strengthened. You don't get strengthened by your confidence, your family life, your job, you get strengthened by being fully committed to God. Yes. The next thing is reflect. Reflect Jesus in servitude. There is no non-functioning part in our body, and there should be no non-functioning part in the church. And if we see that, we need to really bring it up to our sisters and brothers in Christ. Because it's not, you know, someone might respond, well, I come to church all the time. But if you're just coming and you're just sitting, then that would be concerning. Just equally as concerning as it would be if your lungs weren't functioning. You would go to the hospital. You would get help, right? The next thing is awaken your evangelism. I love how Sierra paralleled Jesus uh, resurrecting. Awakening our evangelism in 2018. The fourth thing is being changed through discipling. Yeah. Joali gave incredible practicals, being ready to learn and being eager to transform. None of us are at he in heaven yet, so we have not arrived, right? The last thing is enjoy your walk with God. I love how Jack just brought us to the knees of worship and how important it is to worship yeah. God. You know, it, even enjoying giving to God and giving to God uh, in a cheerful way and trusting and having faith. Now, when I was growing up, I loved the Disney Channel, and there used to be this short um, clip that would say, it's a verb, it's what you do. And um, so I don't want us to just listen to these things, but really have a takeaway. Christianity is a verb. It's what you do. It's an action word. And so... My, my encouragement this morning is to go to your disciple or go to someone who you trust spiritually and ask them, which one of these things can I grow in, can I focus on in 2018? Thank you.